Well, good morning again, Vanna. I am Becky Bennett, and I'm one of the leaders here. And we are so glad to have you here with us in person, online, and at our micro sites at Fort Campbell and Fort Knox. We are, like Pastor Sean said, in the middle of our Summer at Mana series, and we've been getting to hear incredible stories from all sorts of different voices about what it looks like for them to live out their faith in the day today. And there are some powerful voices around us, right? Encouraging us and building us up. But how many of you know there are also voices that want nothing more than to discourage us and tear us down. And it can be hard to distinguish between the voices that speak truth and life from the voices that speak fear and shame. You know, there are days when I can walk so confidently that I know that I know that I know who God is and what he says is true about me. And then there are other days when I feel completely suffocated by thoughts that I'm not doing enough, that I don't measure up, that I've made all the wrong choices, that I'll never be able to keep up, and it's just going to keep on spinning from there. Anybody else ever feel like a slave to the thoughts that run around in your head? But Jesus says in John 8, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But how? How do we know the truth? How do we believe it and remember it and hold on to it in a way that sets us free from the lies that weigh us down? Today, I'd love to share with you how I'm learning to distinguish between the truth and the lies coming from the voices around me and how I choose to dwell on what's true. So I wanna try a little experiment I think insurance companies do a really good job of implanting their voices in our heads. So just to test this theory out, I'm going to say the name of an insurance company, and I want you to sing back to me their jingles. If you're online, we've made special arrangements to be able to hear you singing from wherever you are. So you guys ready? You're going to sing to me? Yeah? Okay. Loud and proud. You ready? State Farm. Okay. Liberty? Mutual? That one took a lot of creativity to write, didn't it? Nationwide. There it is. Okay, how about this one? Farmers. That was a really great audition. You guys can all join the worship team now. All right, but here's the thing. None of you decided... None of you decided at one point that you wanted those jingles lodged in your heads, but they're in there. Something about putting those slogans into songs is working, no matter how annoying they might be to us, right? How do we teach kids the alphabet? We put it to song. See, studies have shown that listening to music activates multiple parts of our brains, particularly those parts associated with memory and emotion. And those insurance companies are counting on you remembering their jingle when you sit down to make a decision about where to put your money. There's a lot of power in a song because it can get stuck in your head and it can shape how you feel and what you then choose to do. With that in mind, it's no accident that roughly 33% of the Bible is written in the form of poetry. And much of that poetry is expressly intended to be put to music. A third of the Bible. Why? Because songs have a powerful way of grabbing our attention through our memory and emotion and therefore influencing our attitudes and our actions. If you open your Bible right to the middle, you'll find yourself in the Psalms. And the whole book of Psalms is a collection of songs. And I love them because they're raw and they're honest and they're beautiful and they're memorable. They paint word pictures and they use intentional language patterns to help us understand and remember who God is and how much he cares about us. And studying these songs and getting them stuck in our heads is a powerful tool 
to help us walk in the truth. So would you turn with me in your Bibles or on your Bible apps to Psalm 46. And as we get ready to work through this Psalm, I wanna highlight some things that stand out about Hebrew poetry that will help us to read this Psalm and every other Psalm for all that they're worth. So first of all, remember that we don't read poetry the way that we would read historical narrative, the way that we would read Acts or First Samuel. We read narrative in a linear fashion. There's a clear beginning, middle, and end. Um, the, it's telling us about an event that took place or about a person in history. But in poetry, we're getting to see emotion and thoughts, not just the facts of what happened. And Hebrew poetry uses parallel lines so that one line will inform or expand on the line before it. And it helps if we read multiple times so that we can catch patterns and repetition of words and phrases if we wanna be able to understand what the author is really trying to say. You know, something really cool to know about the Psalms too is that these aren't just individual pieces of writing meant to stand on their own. Each poem has been expertly crafted and then placed where it is within the whole collection for a reason to create a storyline from the book's beginning to its end. And the Psalms poetically retell the entire story of the Bible. Isn't that neat? But that's a story for another day. For now, just know that the book of Psalms isn't the kind of book that you just read once and then put it down. It's designed for a lifetime of slow rereading and reflection. And it's not just about somebody else or for somebody else. The prayers and laments and songs of praise here are meant to become our own. Okay, so with that in mind, we're gonna go through the whole passage of Psalm 46, and then we're gonna break it down line by line. So let me pray for us as we get started. God, would you help us to know you more? Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to understand and remember what's true so that we can live it. Okay, Psalm 46. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah, come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. So right at the beginning of most of the Psalms in our Bibles, we see a title and an author and a bit of context telling us when or why it was written. Don't just skip over those. Here's why. We see that this psalm was written by the sons of Korah. And you know how when you're going through something hard, there always seems to be that person who does not understand at all, but they think it's their place to say something anyway. Like when you're at a funeral and that person leans over and whispers to you, oh, I so understand. I lost my cat last. You know how there are some people who really do get it? Those are the voices that we really need to hear from when we're going through something hard. Well, let me tell you what we know from the Bible about the sons of Korah. 
rewind to when God raised up Moses and delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. And then they complained and rebelled and they find themselves getting stuck wandering in the wilderness for 40 more years before they can enter the promised land. Okay, so right about there in history, in the book of Numbers chapter 16, we meet this guy named Korah. And Korah doesn't think that Moses is anything special or that God should have put him in charge. And he thinks that lots of people, himself included, should get to be leaders. So Korah raises up a rebellion of 250 influential men against Moses. And in response to Korah's rebellion, God causes the earth to break open and literally swallow those men and their households. And then he causes the earth to close back up over them. So that's fun. Anyway, there's a little note a few chapters later in Numbers 26. In the middle of a census of the people, we get a reminder of what happened to Korah that day, except it says this, but the sons of Korah did not die. And the text doesn't specify whether they were spared because they were too young at the time to participate in the rebellion or whether they just didn't fall in to peer pressure. God doesn't give us more details than that. But what is important for us to know is that for whatever reason, on the day when the earth swallowed up Korah and his men, the sons of Korah were spared. So their family line continued and their children's children went down in history as worship leaders. Listen, you wanna talk about some family trauma in your backstory If anyone is qualified to write the words, even though the earth gives way, and to really get it, it's these guys. So the sons of Korah are the authors of this psalm. Their audience is the people of God, the church, and they're writing Hebrew poetry, and it's intended to be a worship song. With that in mind, let's go to verse one. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Who is? God is. What is he? He's our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Check out the deeper meanings of these words from their original Hebrew describing God here. Refuge means hope, shelter, trust, and strength right here. It means physical might, power, a fortress a stronghold. God is our hope, our shelter, our power, our stronghold, a very present help in trouble. And what does very present mean right there? The Hebrew for very present means well-proved, actually found. It speaks of one who has come, who has arrived, who is able. And help right here, it's not just an idea of help. It's concrete or embodied help, as in practical, tangible, real help, assistance, or support. And what kind of trouble is it talking about here? The word trouble here is defined as distress, anguish, affliction. It also speaks of adversity specifically caused by an enemy. God is here with us, and he is more than able to help us in every kind of distress and pain. You know that you don't need to have me to do this for you guys, right? You don't need the person who stands up here to help you dig apart the Bible and understand like this. I have a really great resource for you. I want you to write this down, okay? Bible Hub, H-U-B, biblehub.com. It's one of my favorite resources because you don't have to have studied the Hebrew and the Greek to be able to see the deeper meanings in these words in the text that were originally written in Hebrew and Greek. You can go on biblehub.com and you can look up a verse and you can click on every single word and you can see the word in the original language that it was written. And then you can look up right there, that word and see what it means in that context and see so much more about what God is actually saying there. You guys can do this. You can do this. So biblehub.com. All right, now we go on to verse two. Verse two, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. This verse starts with therefore. And anytime you see the word therefore in your Bibles, you want to ask what it's there for. See what I did there? It's connecting this line to whatever came before it. God is with us because he's our refuge and our strength and our help. Therefore, we will 
not fear. And what don't we need to be afraid of? We will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. When the earth falls out from underneath us, even if the mountains, those things in our lives that seem so sure and stable and solid, even when those things fall apart and it feels like the ground drops out from beneath us, we will not fear. Even when the sea is raging, fun side note here, the biblical authors often used the sea to describe or to represent chaos. So even when everything feels like chaos, we're not just talking about momentary struggles here. Like even when my toddler is losing it in the checkout line at Target, or even when I can't find my car keys and I'm running late, right? I mean, those are hard, but we're also talking here about even when I lose my job and I can't pay the bills. And even when it feels like my marriage is over, and even when the doctor says it's cancer, Though the earth gives way and the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, even then we don't need to be afraid. Why? Well, it's not because those things aren't scary. Fun fact, the command that's repeated the most times throughout the Bible is not love God or do what's right. It's do not fear. But there's always a reason why given to us when it says, do not fear. Do not fear because God is with you. Do not be afraid because of who God is. Listen to just a few of these verses. Isaiah 41, 10, God says, fear not for I am with you. Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Philippians 4, 5 to 6, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Joshua 1, 9, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? Because the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. We don't have to let fear paralyze us, even when things are legitimately scary, because God is with us. He is our safe place. He is our solid ground, and he will carry us through it all. Moving on, we come to a word that we see three times throughout this psalm. Selah. It means to pause, listen, think about that, or praise. Sometimes it's even translated as forever. God is our refuge and strength, our help right here and now, and he always will be. Even when it feels like our whole world is caving in, we can praise him. Even when we thought what we could rely on is crashing down, he is our safe place. He is our solid ground. Selah. Pause, think about that, praise him. Verses four and five continue. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the most high. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Okay, we've got a river here and we've got the city of God personified, she. So let's break this down. A little cross-referencing through scripture is gonna help us with this. God says in Jeremiah, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And then Jesus says in John, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus is the river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the most high. God is in the midst of her. Who is she here? Well, the city of God, the holy habitation of the most high, it's the place where God dwells. And this Psalm is talking about Jerusalem, the literal city of God, but it also represents the people of God. Remember during the pandemic lockdown when a lot of churches got really angry because they weren't allowed to meet, they couldn't gather. Well, one thing that really stood out to me about manna during that time was Pastor Sean got in front of a screen not from a church building, 
but from his house where he was quarantined. And he reminded us of the truth that the church is not a building. The church is people. And nothing can lock down God's church because God's church is his people. He dwells with us and in us. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We are his dwelling place. So the river that flows through the city of God, it's Jesus in us. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the most high. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. This line, God will help her when morning dawns, comes from a Hebrew phrase that alludes to just in time. God isn't slow. He's thorough. He's never late. Everything he does is just at the right time. It's his time so we can trust him as we wait. Okay, moving on to the next verse. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. All of Psalm 46 about how God is with us and we don't have to be afraid no matter what's happening, about how he's our safe place and our strength, even when the world is falling apart, it all culminates in one central phrase. He utters his voice. He speaks. Back in the very beginning of time, God used his voice to speak everything into existence. Let there be light, and there was. Let there be dry ground and water and plants and animals. And it all happened at the sound of his voice. With his voice, he called everything good. And with his voice, after he made us, he called us very good. And the first man and the first woman walked in the garden of Eden with God and they knew the sound of his voice and they had no fear and they had no shame. But then another voice came on the scene. And in response to that other voice, they began to question the goodness of God. And they chose to go their own way, to go against what his voice had told them. And what happened next? Genesis 3 tells us that they knew they were naked. So they tried to make coverings for themselves. And then when they heard God coming toward them, they hid. And he called to them. God said, where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And what did God say next? He said, who told you you were naked? Let me ask you, what voice, whose voice are you listening to? What's the narrative that's directing your life or telling you who you are? Who told you that you don't have what it takes? Who told you that you're too much or not enough? In the garden, when we were only listening to God's voice, everything was good. But then listening to another voice introduced fear and shame and the world fell apart. With his voice, God made everything from nothing. And this Psalm reminds us that with his voice, he can bring everything to nothing. Those other voices, the ones that speak fear and shame over us, they have no power when we remember the sound of God's voice and we choose to believe what he says is true, let me say that again. Those other voices, the ones that speak fear and shame over us have no power when we remember the sound of God's voice and we choose to believe what he says is true. Verse seven goes on. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. The placement of those two phrases next to one another, it's on purpose. The Lord of hosts and the God of Jacob reminds us that he's the God over all of heaven and he's the God of his people. He's the God who's farther than the farthest galaxy and he's closer than my skin. This God is our fortress. This God is our safe place. And there's that word again, 
Remember what it's telling us to do. Pause, listen, think about that. Praise him. Verses eight and nine continue. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. It says, come, behold. It means, hey, lean in. Look and see. Remember. Remember what God has done before because he's still the same God now. There is no enemy too strong for him. He's working everything out. There's no kingdom, no institution, no weapon, no power that can stand against him. And because he's with you, this sounds a lot like Isaiah 54 right here, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And now we get to my favorite part. Verse 10 shifts from the psalmist's voice to God's voice. And he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Jesus gives us a beautiful confidence in John 10 when he says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you're one of his sheep, you know his voice. You may not hear him audibly, but he says, you know, the sound of his voice. I need to remember that. I need to trust how that I know what it sounds like. And I also know what it feels like when the voices around me are speaking what God says is true, when they're reflecting God's voice. You know why? Because I need to be able to hold on to that when I hear voices that aren't his. How do I hear God's voice over all the other voices? The Hebrew word for be still is rafa. Are you ready for what it means? It means to relax, to become helpless, to let go, to slacken. Slacken. Is that even a word? It means to show oneself slack like this. Okay, remember that image. I'm gonna come back to it. The the Hebrew word for know right here, be still and know. The Hebrew word for know, there is a really active term. It means to learn, to find out, to admit, to recognize, to understand. So be still, let go, slacken, and you'll learn that he is God. Okay, that sounds great, but I've heard far too many people in my lifetime stand at a distance, and tell me to let go and let God. And I don't know about you, but with the amount of anxiety that I can produce, I'm gonna need something a little more tangible than that. In the middle of it all, you know, when the earth is giving way and the mountains are falling into the sea and I'm overwhelmed and I'm clinging to control and I'm beating myself up and regretting the decisions that I've made and I'm frantically trying to fix all the things and figure out all the answers, I need a tool something practical that I can do because I do not know how to just let go and let God. So we're gonna grab a hold of that definition for be still that says it means to slacken. I need to slacken and know that God is God and that he's with me and that he's got this. Let me show you what this looks like, okay? You're getting ready to come to church to worship Jesus been a long week, and you're so ready. And just as you're about to walk out the door, you turn around and you realize that one of your kids isn't wearing any pants. And the dog pees on the floor. And you can't find your keys. And you get in a fight with your spouse in the car because you're both really sure that you know that it was the other one who lost the keys. And then somebody cuts you off in the parking lot right as you pull into the church. And then you get a notification on your phone that your boss just emailed you and said that you need to redo that project one more time. And you walk in the door and everybody's smiling and reaching out with hugs. And they all say, how are you? And you're like, I'm great. And they're like, I thank God, good. And you're like, all the time. And you hold it together all the way through service until you get back to the car. And as soon as you get in the car, you snap. Why? Because when you hold on tight to control, 
whether you're trying to control your circumstances or the outcomes or your kid's behavior or the way people see you or how everything works out, you will inevitably break. I keep learning this the hard way. When my stomach is in knots, because I feel like I can't say no to somebody, or I'm frustrated because things just got added to my plate and they're really throwing off the plans that I had, or when I'm frantically striving, like it all depends on me, and I'm desperately trying to meet all the expectations that I have for myself and all the expectations that I think everybody else has for me, and even all the expectations that I think God has for me in all the tension that life brings. I have to remember the sound of his voice and I find it when I slacken. So how, how do I do that? It's really simple. I pause and I breathe. It's like hitting a reset button. I breathe slowly and I choose to remember that God is that I can't do this apart from him. I breathe and then I remind myself of what's true. God is my refuge and my strength. (sighs) Even when the world is caving in. Jesus, you're here. You're fighting for me. You're working it all out. You know, the breath that God put in our lungs is such a gift for so many reasons, for our physical and mental health. Studies show that deep, slow breathing can actually lower blood pressure. It can reduce stress hormones. It can, Im- it can improve immune system function and digestion and sleep. It can elevate mood and it can increase physical energy. And if we stop breathing, we die, right? But God has given us this incredible picture through our very breath of how to stay alive. Because in the Bible, The same Hebrew word that means breath also means spirit. It's God's life in us. Breathe. He's right here. Be still. Slacken. Speak the truth from his word over yourself and your situation. You know, being still doesn't remove a problem that I may need to solve, but it releases the tension in me. It stops me from spinning so that I can think clearly to actually do what needs to be done. It reminds me of who I belong to and that God is who he says he is. And then he gives me the confidence to do the next right thing, to act, not just react. Maybe I still have to press on in something that's hard. Maybe I still have to preach the truth to myself and choose to believe it. But when I still my heart, when I slacken, when I take a deep, slow breath, I can remember that God is with me and that he will give me strength for whatever my next step might be. And the final words of this psalm repeat verse seven and wrap right back around to where it all started. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. There's that repetition again, reminding us that this is really something we can hang our hats on. The God who's over the whole universe, but who's also really close. He's with us and he's got us. Be still, breathe, let go of your grip on control because he's with you no matter what comes, even if even when, even though. I'm learning. I'm trying to learn this. But I still live a lot of days like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. And if, like, if I make the wrong move, I'm going to be the reason that the whole earth shattered and then that the mountains came crashing down. Listen, just three days ago, I was curled up in, the ball, in a ball on the couch crying to my husband because this is such a fresh lesson for me. Can we thank God that he's so patient and faithful to make sure we have lots of opportunities to learn the things that we can't get through our heads? 
So let me just give you some backstory here on the sobbing mess that I was on the couch. My kids are 12, uh, 14, 12, and 10 right now, and I homeschool them, but I have not always homeschooled them, nor did I ever imagine before I had kids that I ever would homeschool them. And can I just tell you that the decision for us to homeschool them has been one of the most terrifying, heavy decisions that I've ever had to make. So much, in fact, that we've gone back and forth between homeschool and public school five different times, sometimes because of health reasons, sometimes because we've moved to another state in the middle of a school year, sometimes for character building reasons and academic reasons, or because after praying and praying and praying, I just have this feeling in my gut that says this is the right thing for them. And through each of the five times that we've gone back and forth, I've been so confident one day that I'm the mom that God gave to my kids. And so I know what's best for them and what they need. And he's got this and it's all going to be okay. And then the next day I'm curled up in a ball on the couch sobbing because I'm pretty sure I'm ruining my kids' lives. And there's not going to be enough money in all the world to pay for all the therapy sessions they're going to need because their mom couldn't just get it together. I told you I need to breathe. So there I was on the couch crying again about whether or not homeschool is the best thing for our kids. And simultaneously, I was beating myself up over the fact that I can't just chill out about it. And you know what my husband said to me? He got really close and he said, Becky, stop it. I mean, he did actually say that first, but then he said, Becky, when you stand before God at the end of your days, He will not be standing over you with a list of all the ways that you could have done more or should have known better or might have avoided that roadblock or averted that challenge. When you stand before him at the end of your days, do you know what he will say? He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, my beloved child because at the end of the day, our kids' future is in God's hands. At the end of the day, your future is in God's hands. So you can trust him and breathe. In my husband's defense, for anybody who knows him, that was the Becky version of what he said. His version was a little bit more succinct. But it's true for me and it's true for you. You know what God doesn't do for us? He doesn't show us how things are all gonna turn out. He doesn't let us see the whole picture. But do you know what he does do for us? He lets us make decisions with the information that we have today. And then he makes a way, whatever that looks like. So we pray and we do the best we can to walk in God's way with the information that we have in front of us right now. And then we breathe. And when we breathe, we can remember that he is God. He just is. And we can trust that he's working everything out for his glory and our good. This is how I'm learning to distinguish between the voice of God and every other voice. So hear his voice in this psalm saying, singing over you. Be still and know that I am God. Let's let this be the song that's stuck in our heads today. Would you pray with me? God, we need you. And we thank you so much that you've put breath in our lungs so that we can breathe and we can trust you. Would you help us to live like we believe that you really are here? Would you give us the strength to live like we believe that you really are in control, like you've really got this, like you're gonna work everything out no matter what it looks like. Help us to walk unafraid, trusting you for who you are, looking to you for strength. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna pray one more prayer because I know that there are some of you who have never breathed like this before because you haven't given your life to Jesus. And he says, I wanna be the breath in your lungs. I wanna take your life and I wanna make it new. And I want you to know that you can trust me. I died for you so that you can have life in me. 
So if that's you this morning, if you want to breathe this kind of fresh air that's gonna last for eternity, that's gonna secure your life for eternity, I want you to pray this prayer with me to give your life to Jesus right now, to surrender to him. Would you pray this with me? Jesus, thank you that you're enough, that you gave your life for me and you conquered death so that I could live. Would you take my life Forgive me of trying to go my own way. I want to follow you. Would you come and take over, take control of my life so that I can live with you and for you for all of my days? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Can we give a hand to anybody who just prayed that prayer for the first time? That's the most important decision, the most important breath of fresh air that you can ever...